shall rise up to pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you because you are a great Father. Lord Jesus, thank you because you are our Savior. I will come to you tonight, Lord, to hear the word from you, so that, Lord, those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, they will see themselves, and then see Calvary, see the sacrifice you have made for them, and they will come to know the Lord as their Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. And for those of us who are your children, because we are saved, by grace and cleansed by the blood that cleanses us from all sin. Lord, we pray today you show us a way to live to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, help us, Lord, as members of the body of Christ, members of every local church to live the way you want us to live so that your love, your compassion, your mercy will flow through us to all the congregation in Jesus' name. Once again, we're pleading that to open our eyes to see what we ought to see. And the things we knew before which we are forgetting, you remind us in Jesus' name. And grant us the grace to live by the word you teach us. Because we know it's not just the hearers of the word alone that are blessed, but the doers of the word. The mind to obey, the heart to obey, the desire to obey, and the grace to do what you're showing us in your word. You grant every one of us. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered us. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. And everybody said, yeah. Amen. Thank you very much. We come to our Bible study tonight with great expectation. Every time we come before the Word of God, we expect the Lord, our Father Himself, God in heaven, to speak to our hearts. And we expect that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who has brought us into the kingdom. And he wants us to live the life of the kingdom. Who shows where we are falling short of that life. And where we need to live that life to the glory of his name. That's the expectation we have tonight. As we come before the Lord, telling him that he will show us his own mind, his own word, his own will. And reveal his wisdom to us and then the strength and the spiritual energy that we need to be able to carry out the word of God. The sincerity we need and the honesty we need that the Lord will grant it to us and then our lives will be the better for the study in Jesus' name. Today we come to Matthew chapter 7. We've already gone through Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 5, we laid the foundation of Christian experience. Christian experience for the people that are coming to know the Lord. It's in that place, the Lord himself, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the King of the kingdom. It shows us the way, the very foundation of the kingdom life. As it tells us about the people that are poor in spirit, the humility that ought to be the groundwork. That you have in your heart as you are coming to know the Lord. And it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There the gate opens for the penitent, for the repentant, for, the, uh, for those who are humble and they're lowly in spirit, and they enter into the kingdom of God. And as Jesus Christ continued, he began to tell us that we need to grow. In the experience we have as you enter into the kingdom. And he begins to talk about those who mourn. You see all the people that are still living in sin. And you mourn. You shed tears of compassion for them. And then the Lord begins to save them. And while they're growing up and you're also interacting with them, you're meek and lowly and gentle. And Jesus said, blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. And then you yourself, you don't want to stay just at that level of salvation being born again. You want to go deeper in the Lord, higher in the Lord. And you want to have greater Christian experiences. And then you begin to hunger. You begin to thirst. After righteousness. Until you are filled. It purifies your heart. Because that's your desire. 
you came into the kingdom on this earth so that in the eternal kingdom you'll be able to see the almighty God face to face and to see the Lord you need that purity of heart holiness of life that you'll be able to live such a life that the Lord will be able to open the gate of the heavenly kingdom, eternal kingdom unto you when you die. And that's why it says, blessed, happy, fortunate, and the people that have known the Lord and now they have this desire in them and the desire is being fulfilled happy and blessed are those who are pure in heart because they shall see god and then when it purifies your heart you come into ministry you begin to be a peace lover and a peacemaker and the people that are away from the lord you are reconciling them of the lord that's why it says blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of god and you're go you going to have your measure of persecution in this world and in that persecution you are rejoicing in the lord that's the kingdom life you come into the kingdom as we come into the kingdom there are some spiritual things we need to carry out and that's what he goes into in, in Matthew chapter 6. Our prayer life, our fasting life, as well as our arms giving, our good deeds. The things we do to show we're members of the kingdom of God. How we stretch out the hand of service unto all the people. That's what he's dealing with. And then he tells us, uh, we're, we're doing something for heaven. You're laying up your treasure in heaven. The good that you do in this life. The wonderful things, you know, because you know, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And it's those good works you do in Christ that will make you to have the reward when you eventually get to heaven. That's why you're not laying all your treasure on earth. The good deeds you do with all the substance you have, you lay your treasure in heaven because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then you keep your motive, your intention. You keep that pure because the light of the body is the eye. And if the eye be single, sound, and healthy, how great is that light? But see, there's backsliding. And then you begin to have some private agenda, ulterior motive. And if the, if the eye, if there's darkness there, how great is that darkness? And then he wants us again trying to serve two masters. Serving God on the one hand and serving self on the other hand. And he says it's utterly impossible impracticable and therefore he says to serve God and God only then he tells us about the great a problem that you know people have in this life the problem of worry and anxiety and then he tells us if you see how your father God in heaven is caring for the lilies and the grass and the flowers and the birds of the air don't you think that the almighty God our heavenly father who knows our need don't you think he'll care for you he said yes he'll care for you then he says therefore take no thought even for tomorrow the morrow will the tomorrow will take care of the things of itself leave it day at a time and then every time you wake up, you say, this is the day the Lord has made. Or rejoice and be glad in it. Now he comes to chapter 7. As he comes to chapter 7, he begins to deal with relationship. Relationship. You are not an isolated person. You are a member of a family, a child in the family. Having prayers, father and mother. Or a brother, a sister in the family, having brothers and sisters. Or maybe you are the father, having children and wife. And then maybe you are the mother, you have a husband, and you have children. And then you live in the community. And it wants us to carry the light that we have, the light of the gospel, and carry it into our community. That's why it begins to talk about our relationships. Now, as it talks about our relationship, it is a major problem we have. Especially those who study the Bible, those who study the Word of God. You study the Bible, you already have a high standard. How you ought to live, how we ought to live. And if we're not careful, everybody you see around us, you begin to measure them with the things you have seen and the things you have heard. 
see my daddy and see my mommy and look at what I study in uh, Matthew chapter 5. Mommy and daddy, they are not living up to that. What a great danger. Our knowledge of the word of God as we study chapter 5 and chapter 6, our knowledge is likely to make us critical, judging other people or maybe members of the family members of the community the knowledge we have instead of just improving ourselves and living a life that is glorious a life that is gracious a life that is growing in the things of the lord we begin to use our knowledge to measure other people criticize other people judge other people that's why jesus comes to this section now and it tells us the reason we have knowledge is not to criticize, condemn, judge other people. It's for us to know that we need to live a life that is glorifying to the Lord so that other people will see the goodness of the Lord in our lives. And then without any criticism, without any condemnation, they will be able to live after the example we show them. That's what brings us to the study today. Caution against uncharitable judgment. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Yet Jesus Christ gives a command to every believer, every member of the body of Christ. And he says, judge not. That ye be not judged. He cautions every child of God on the common practice of judging and condemning one another. It is not acting on the principle of love. It is not acting on the basis of what we have learned in Matthew chapters 5 and 6. When anyone turns the family or the, or the Christian community to a law court and appoints himself as a judge, as a magistrate over all the actions of all the other people. The true child of God possesses a new heart. It's purified in his heart. And it's merciful. And he's a peace lover, a peacemaker. And he's a real child of God, having the very nature of Christ in him. He has a new heart and a new spirit. A critical spirit that makes someone to criticize and condemn everyone around, everything around him is not the spirit of Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ over here, he wants to say, have you learned something from chapter 5? Apply it to yourself. Judge not. Have you learned something in chapter 6? Apply it to your personal private life. Judge not. Love is of God. And the perpetual state of mind that watches over others falls. While overlooking his own faults is contrary to fairness or kindness or love. Demanding very high standard of living from other people while he himself demonstrates low standard and moral standard that's on christian that's on scriptural after removing the beam in our own eye then we can only only then can we help our brother remove the moat in his eye look at verse 2 for with what judgment ye judge he shall be judged and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye? Why are you making all your application of everything you learned in chapters 5 and 6? And then you are planning each of the little, literally significant faults in the lives of the people around you. Why do you behold the moat in thy brother's eye? And considerest not the beam in thine own eye. What's your purpose of study? What's your purpose of learning the word of God? Is it just to look at this mirror of the world and then you see the beam in your own eye and then you don't do anything about it? All you are watching, you care more for the righteousness in the lives of other people than you care about the righteousness in your life. How will you say to your brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye and behold the beam is in thy own eye thou hypocrite first cast out the beam out of thine eye and then it says and then shall thou see clearly to cast out the moat out 
of thy brother's eye. The Lord is saying the reason for studying the word and the reason for learning the word is not to judge other people, it's to see the fault in our lives, the sin in anybody's life, the shortcoming in anybody's life, and then deal with that. When you deal with that, then you'll be able to see clearly to help all the people. We're going to divide the study tonight to three points. Number one, explanation of unrighteous judgment. Judge not that she be not judged. What does, what does that mean? The explanation of unrighteous judgment. Number two, the examples of unlawful judgment. Examples, those examples, they open our eyes to see and they help us to understand what Jesus Christ was actually teaching. Examples of unlawful judgment. Number three, exhortation to unbiased judgment. Let's come to number one. Number one, explanation of unrighteous judgment. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Judge not that she be not judged. Judge not. That's Christ's command. But what's the meaning of that command? Because if we do not understand what Christ means by this, we shall not be able to properly obey. Therefore, you have to find out what did he mean by that. I heard what he said. I know those words. I understand the implication of that. What's the depth of the meaning? How can I understand that? How do I apply that to my life, to my situation? Does it mean we must never see, we must never evaluate, we must never correct any wrong thing that others do? Does that mean that when our children do wrong, judge not, we must never put our children right? But the Bible says, train a child in the way he should go. And if we interpret it like that, we are going to contradict a lot of verses in the Bible. Does that mean that in the nation, a judge, a magistrate should not sit down to say this is wrong and that is wrong? If we apply it that way, we are going to bring anarchy into the country where criminals do whatever they want to do. And the judge is saying, judge not that ye be not judged. That's the reason we need to understand what Jesus meant by what he said. Does that mean that we should not hold any standard of behavior? We should be indulgent and tolerant, accepting whatever anyone does as right? Does it mean to cover up sin and wrongdoing, leaving everyone to his own conscience and never correct anyone? No, it doesn't mean that. We must take all the words of Jesus together and not interpret one part to contradict another part. Now, if you look at this, it says in this same chapter 7, in chapter 7 it says in verse 5, it says, pause, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Then shall thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Obviously, that means that we're going to correct that brother. We're going to uh, put that brother right. We're going to tell that brother, no, this is not okay. But before we do that, we deal with ourselves first. Not only that, do you know it says in verse 6, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Now, how do you know who the dogs are if you don't look at their character, if you don't judge their character, if you don't evaluate the things they do? The Lord expects us to judge. But it says, judge not. What does that mean? We'll explain that later. But I was just preparing the ground for you to know the Lord is not saying, just close your eyes. You know, when you walk through life, don't see anything that anybody does. Don't comment about anything that anybody does. And don't correct anybody. The Lord is not saying that. It says, do not give that which is holy unto the dogs. Identify the dogs and know them judge their character and know that they are dogs and yet it says judge not that she be not judged and then in Matthew chapter 7 we're looking at verse 15 beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ramming in wolves 
beware of sheep of uh, those false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Judge their fruits. Evaluate their fruits. Examine their fruits. And have some verdict on their fruits. That's judging. That means then, this is not a unilateral thing that just says, judge not. Don't comment. Don't correct. It doesn't mean that. The Lord tells us exactly what to do. So then, when he said, judge not, what's he driving at? Luke chapter 6. We're looking at verse 37. Luke chapter 6. We're looking at verse 37. Judge not, that she be not judged. Condemn not, that ye be not condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. He's telling us, don't condemn. Yes, you can correct people. You can point the way to them. You can tell them, this isn't right. This is not all right for you. This is the way to go. That's not the way to go. This is the way to go. But don't condemn them. Do you remember when somebody was brought to the Lord Jesus Christ? And then they said, we took this man in adultery, in the very act. And the other people, they judged. They said, Moses and the Lord said, a woman like this shall be stoned. What do you say? In John chapter 8, we're looking at verse 10. John chapter 8. We're reading from verse 10. You'll see what Jesus did here. In John chapter 8 verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto our woman, Where are those nine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? You understand? Has no man condemned thee? The Lord was telling the woman, Adultery is bad. Adultery is evil. I condemn adultery. But the adulterer or the adulteress, don't condemn. Judge not. The action is wrong. But there's forgiveness for the actor. The sin is wrong. But there's forgiveness for the sinner. The fellow who has done something wrong, that wrong deed is wrong. But there's mercy, there's forgiveness, there's grace for the person that has done the wrong thing. That's what the Lord was saying. Judge not that he be not judged. In verse 11, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee. The day of judgment has not come. Forgiveness available. And grace is available. And the kindness, loving kindness of God is available. Neither do I condemn thee. But go and sin no more. Go and sin no more means I condemn what you have done. Don't do that again. That's not right. The sin is wrong. The evil is wrong. But go and sin no more. Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. I condemn darkness. But the people that have walked in darkness until now, I forgive them. And then they can follow me now. And then they will not walk in darkness anymore, but shall have the light of life. Isaiah chapter 29. What Jesus said, judge not. You know, there are some people that they have such a critical spirit, such a negative attitude, that everything they see and everyone they see, uh, they are even watching for the fault. They are watching for the sin. And they are watching. It's like somebody, you know, going, on, going around with a microscope and is looking very critically on at everything everybody does. That's what the Lord is saying. Don't go about with a critical spirit, a critical attitude, watching, watching for fault, watching for a mistake, watching for somebody to stumble, and watching, yes, I catch you, I catch I knew you will do it. Judge not. In Isaiah chapter 29, see what the Lord is saying in verse 21. Isaiah chapter 29. I'm reading from verse, let me back up to verse 20. For the terrible one is brought to naught, 
and this corner is consumed and all that watch for iniquity you see that all that watch for iniquity those are the critical people they're looking for something to criticize they're looking for somebody to condemn and it says all that watch for iniquity are cut off that make a man an offender for a word that make a man an offender for a word they, they don't look at all the other good things the man has done. They don't look at all the other good words the man has written. They don't look at any other thing, beautiful things, wonderful things in the life of the man. They're looking, they're looking for a fault. That's why Jesus said, judge not. Are you going about with a critical attitude, a critical spirit, watching for mistake that should make a man an offender for a word and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate and turn aside the jaws for a sin of naught? They condemn people for non essential things that don't matter at all, like the Pharisees. Why do your disciples eat without washing their hands to the elbow? Things that are non-essential, insignificant things. Why is it they are passing through the field on the Sabbath day and they are taking ears of corn and they are rubbing and eating? Insignificant things. Like Judas says, Carol, why is this woman pouring the oil on Christ? We could have sold that and given to the poor. And the man was having evil in start to betray Jesus Christ. The people that are so critical, they themselves are so evil, so hypocritical. But then any little sin another person does, I, I catch you, I catch you. You are a sinner, you are a backslider. Don't go about with such a critical spirit. Making a man, making a believer, making a child of God near to you, an offender for a word. And then condemning other people for a sin of not things that do not matter at all. And that's what the Lord is telling us and is saying that now everything we have learned is to make us better. Everything we have learned is not to make us judges. It's not to make us look at other people and condemn them. You know, that, that's what some people only get from the study of their Bible. Everything they learn, everything they study is to be able to say, ah, now I know the truth. They don't know the truth for themselves. I know the truth. That person is wrong. That one is a backslider. That one is a witch. That one is a wizard. That one is this. That one is this. I can be you an know, better than everybody. That's what Jesus said. Don't do. Let the study of the word make you a better man, a better woman. And not make you a judge over everybody else in the community. Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, we're reading from verse 10. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why don't you help your brother, assist your brother, encourage your brother? Why do you judge your brother? And why dost thou say that not thy brother? You forget every good thing the brother has done. And just for a little word, and just for a little event, and just for a little thing, then every good thing he has done is off your mind. And you judge him so terribly and so heavily that it becomes like nobody, like nothing before, just for just a little insignificant thing. In verse, in verse 10 it says, And why dost thou say that not thy brother? For what? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Why don't you think about your life then? What account are you going to give? You're not going to give account for brother A or sister B. Well, you then all the time correcting brother A, all the time correcting sister B. Why don't you think about yourself? Brother A will answer for himself. Sister B will answer for herself. Why don't you then think about your life when you have opportunity and find out, am I saved? Am I born again? Am I living a life? that will qualify me for heaven. Am I staying in Christ and staying in the grace of God? Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge 
one another anymore. He's saying, don't waste precious time judging other people. Don't waste precious time criticizing other people. Let us not judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. We're looking at John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, we're looking at verse 6. If you know anybody in the New Testament that actually gave themselves to a ministry, a ministry of condemnation, a ministry of criticism, a ministry of finding fault, a ministry of judging, judging unrighteously, is the Pharisees. And those people are the worst in the New Testament. They didn't have any grace of God. There was no love of God in their heart. All they had was a kind of cranky, dry self-righteousness that never did anybody any good. And as you look at the New Testament, there's no good thing you'll see recorded uh, against their name that they did this wonderful thing, this good thing, this good thing. But Jesus went about doing good. And they were following after Jesus, criticizing everything he did. If he healed the sick, they criticized. If he raised the dead, they criticized. If he preached the word, they criticized. Anything he said, anything he did, they criticized. And Jesus went about doing good. And these critical spirit people, they never did anything good. You don't want to be like like that you don't want to be like that you know just see your family the wife is doing this and doing this and doing that and and you know and she's not complaining and all you have is condemnation and criticism you don't want to be like that and then the children they go to school they study all those wonderful subjects and you know and, and they're trying their best and then there's a little fault and you are not studying anything. You don't want to be critical of those children. Just, just condemn everything. And daddy is trying to, you know, pay school fees and is paying house rent and is doing this and doing this. And then he's not able to do this little sin. You don't want to be so critical. What has daddy done? What's he doing, by the way? You want to appreciate the good things other people are doing and not going. But following after them like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, condemning every good thing they have done just because of a little sin. Judge not. That she be not judged. In John chapter 8, we're looking at verse, uh, uh, verse 26. How many things to say and to judge of you? But he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I've heard of him. And Jesus turned around, you know, just to tell them, Pharisees, Sadducees, I have many things to say and to judge of you but that's not my ministry now he didn't have a lot to create jesus said which of you convinces me of sin and yet they had a lot to judge jesus on but jesus said you know if i were to engage in that's the ministry you're trying to engage in to criticize and to judge and to condemn I have many, many things to say and to judge of you. But I'm not doing that. That's not a good ministry. That's why you should ask yourself, what kind of ministry do you have? The ministry of the Pharisees, the ministry of the Sadducees, judging, 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 criticizing, condemning, slashing down people of a critical spirit. In John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why did God send you to that community? To criticize, to judge, to condemn. Why has God sent you to that house fellowship? To criticize, to condemn, to judge, to beat down other people? Why has God sent you to that community to criticize and to judge? See what Jesus said. If Jesus were to judge, he knew the details and the secrets of all men. But he said, no, it's to save men that have come. 
we do realize then the Lord has sent you here so you can be a helping, you can give a helping hand and you lead people to salvation in Jesus' name. We're coming now to point number two, examples of unlawful judgment. Examples of unlawful judgment. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. He said, in us here, judge not that ye be not judged. Unlawful judgment. You know there are people that judge like that. Life is full of unlawful judgment. In our daily interaction with one another, men judge and condemn one another. And they increase hatred and condemnation in the human family. You see, when you judge people, you know, people resent that critical, that criticism. If you judge somebody, you're not going to make friends because you judge, you condemn. Your knowledge is going to make you not have any friends. You don't have a lot of knowledge. And then you apply that knowledge, or maybe I show you misapply that knowledge by condemning people, criticizing people, judging people. The more you know, the more you criticize people, you're not going to have friends. You're going to bring a disunity in your family. You're going to make your children to run away from the home. If you want to have friends, if you want to, people to love you and to relate with you properly, judge not that she be not judged. The Lord is calling us to live a life uh, of the, uh, through the principle of love. Our priority in life should be to live in righteousness and grow in grace and holiness each day. We should be more strict and firm with ourselves. And we should be compassionate with other people, tender towards other people, rather than demanding much from others while we're lenient, lenient with ourselves. Those who demand perfection from others, while the tolerating perfection in themselves will always be guilty of unlawful judgment. Always be guilty of unlawful judgment. The people that they're lenient on themselves, if they make a mistake, so they say that that's a mistake, that's a mistake. If other people make the same mistake, then they pounce on them as if, you know, they have not done something like that themselves before. It's unwise to correct and counsel others to be righteous and holy. And you're so eager that other people get to heaven while you yourself, you excuse sin and unrighteousness in your life on your way to hell fire. And the Bible tells us, you know, this kind of unlawful judgment. If you look at your outline, there are seven of them. Number one, hypocritically judging other people. Number two, hastily judging other people. Number three, presumptuously judging other people. Number four, unfairly judging other people. And number five, unnecessarily, unnecessarily judging other people. I wonder, is even nothing to judge, nothing to criticize, unnecessarily judging other people. Number six, unmercifully judging other people. Number seven, officially, officiously judging other people. When nobody has made you a ruler, a judge, a leader, a magistrate over there. Let's look at them one by one. Uh, hypocritically judging other people. That means condemning others. What you yourself excuse in yourself. Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. Uh, the background story to this is that uh, Judah had uh, sons. And this uh, woman, Tamar, got married to one of the sons. Something happened, that son died. And then this lady or this woman, Tamar, was given to another son of Judah. And eventually that one also died. So Judah said, Tamar, go and stay in your father's house. When this one gets older, I'll call you and then you'll get married to him. But Judah was not faithful to the covenant. And the woman saw that Judah was not faithful. And so what the woman did was to put away the garment of widowhood and then stayed by the roadside. And the Judah saw she was a harlot, a prostitute, and then said, can I come in to you? And the woman said, you must give me a pledge and then give the pledge and then messed up with her and then went away. And then the woman became pregnant 
And they told Judah, they said, your daughter-in-law is pregnant. Oh, he said, bring her out. She's going to be born. And then the woman said, well, look at this signet and this thing. Who has it? And Judah recognized that he was the one. He was judging that woman for the same sin he himself committed. They are hypocrites like that. They are committing that sin privately. And then publicly, they are judging other people. Now that you know the story, look at that, uh, Genesis chapter 38. I'm reading from verse 24. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by water. And Judah said, Bring her forth. And let her be born. When she brought, when she was brought forth, she said to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, look at this, and, and then find out, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and the bracelets and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I. I was condemning her for the sin I was guilty of myself. Examine your life. Are you like that? Especially in the family circle. What you condemn in your wife. What you condemn in your husband. What you condemn in your children. What you condemn in your neighbors. What you condemn in the leadership in the church. What you complain about in members of the church. Are you guilty of those sins yourself? The Lord Jesus cautions us against that kind of hypocritically judging others, condemning others, what we ourselves are excusing ourselves. Number two, he warns us of hastily judging others, condemning others before the facts of the case are known. Not even bothering to find out what are the facts of the case. And then we judge. John chapter 7, verse 51. John chapter 7, verse 51. He's still judging other people. Why are you not patient? Look at the facts. Find out the details. The reasons why. The motives, the intention behind the action. Before you pass comment, before you correct. John chapter 7, verse 51. Here, Nicodemus was asking the people, Does our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? A report has come. Brother so and so, sister so and so has done this and that. Give sister so and so upon you to defend herself. Give us chance to put all the records straight. And then to say, no, it's not like that. It's like this. These are the facts. Find out the facts before you pass comment. Does our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he does? Number three, presumptuously judging others. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke us. For presumptuously judging others, jumping to uncharit uncharitable conclusion on the basis of unconfirmed rumors. Unconfirmed rumors. Rumors are flying about. And as a result of the rumors flying about, you're only passing comment. Wait a minute. Have you confirmed that rumor? Have you found out the details? Are you very sure beyond the shadow of doubt that the rumor is right, is true? Can you prove it to us before you pass judgment? You see, that is uh, that's some fear. Presumptuously judging others and jumping to an uncharitable conclusion before you find out that the rumor is confirmed. Jeremiah chapter 37. In Jeremiah chapter 37. Here we're reading from verse 12. Jeremiah 27 verse 12. Then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem. 
to go into the land of Benjamin to separate himself there in the midst of the people. And when he was in the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the world was there whose name was Elijah and the son of Shalemiah, the son of Ananiah. And he took Jeremiah the prophet saying, Thou fallest away to the Chaldeans. He said, You have joined the Chaldeans. And now you are in the army of the Chaldeans. Now you have gone to Babylon. And I hear, we hear the rumors. You are not part of them. You are not a true Israelite anymore. Then said Jeremiah, it is false. It's not right. How could you believe that? How could I go and join the Babylonians and the Chaldeans and still be a prophet of the Lord? And the Lord will be speaking through me. I fall not in which of the Chaldeans, but he hearkened not to him. So he rided to Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. Where, wherefore, the princes were wroth with Jeremiah, and they smote him for nothing. He had done nothing wrong, and they smote him. Can you think of that? Can you think of, you know, Christian people punishing somebody because of rumors that are not true, and presumptuously judging others? That's what Jesus said. Judge not. You are basing your criticism and your judgment on rumors, and you have not confirmed that. Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah, and they smote him, and they put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for he had made, for they had made that the prison. Number four, the Lord is telling us not to judge people unfairly. He forbids unfair, unfairly judging others, ignoring everything that is favorable to our brother, and not giving him a fair hearing. That he is just making up their minds that no, he's wrong. We know he's wrong. How do you know he's wrong? Have you looked at all the points and put all the points together and then see which ones are right and which ones are wrong? No, we don't need to do that. We know he's wrong. In John chapter 9, that's exactly the Pharisee style. That's how they do things. They actually wanted to judge and condemn. They were looking for a loophole. They were looking for something that they can hold on to so as to be able to judge. John chapter 9 verse 24. Then again called in the man that was blind, and he said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. We were talking about Jesus. They said, hey, Don't worry about this. You have been blind. We can see. We know. We know beyond any shadow of doubt that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether it's a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled, they, they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. Wait a minute. You've never seen Moses. Moses died more than a thousand years ago. All you are thinking about Moses is what you read in Exodus, uh, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses is dead. This one, this is Christ. You can see this one. And you know that this man works many miracles. What are we going to do? The whole world is going after him. You know this one. This one is not history. This one is a fact. And the Moses, they didn't know that died a thousand years before, more than a thousand years before, they said, as for Moses, we know. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that she know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. I think that's good preaching. What do you think? That's logical. We know that. They, look at this man. He opened my eyes. I was born blind. And we know that God heareth not sinners. If this man were not of God, God would not have heard him. Now listen to what he said. In verse, he said, since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. 
If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. They didn't want to hear evidence. They didn't want to see the facts. All they wanted to do is condemn the man. How about this evidence? Don't show me that. How about this evidence? Don't tell me that. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't do that. If the evidence is coming to you, look at this and look at this and look at this. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see those things before. Now that I see the evidence, I know that I wasn't right in condemning you. That's what Jesus is saying. Judge not. That she be not judged. I do not get into that kind of unfair judging of others. Number five, Christ's teaching restrains us from unnecessarily judging others. Unnecessarily judging others. Condemning a fellow brother for something the scripture is silent about. Have you noticed that there are some things the scripture does not say anything about? And then we judge other people on the things, the total silence in scripture. Look at Job chapter 32. Job chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 3. In Job chapter 32 verse 3, also against his three friends was his wrath kindled, because they had found no answer, yet they had condemned Job. All the things that happened to Job, God was silent. He didn't call anybody to tell them this, why this happened, this, why this happened, this, why that happened. Everything was total silence. And what God was silent about, these people, they began to pick up Job. And they, they, they just tore him to pieces. And they condemned him. The Lord doesn't want us to condemn anybody, criticize anybody on things that the scripture is totally silent about. I say, okay, you're trying to correct this brother, criticize this brother, almost destroy this brother's life. And uh, what has he done? This is what he has done. Can you show me a chapter, a verse in the Bible where that thing is condemned? You have no verse. You have no scripture. All I just know is that I'm going to condemn him. I'm going to criticize him. Don't condemn people. Criticize people. Correct people on what the scripture is silent about. Number six, it teaches us again, unmerciful judge, unmercifully judging other people, instructing us that those who have received mercy must also show mercy and refrain from judging. In 2 Samuel, I'm reading from chapter 12. 2 Samuel, chapter 12 and we're reading there from verse 1 second samuel chapter 12 verse 1 and the lord said say uh, nathan unto david and he came unto him and said unto him there were two men in one city listen to this story very well the one rich and the other poor and the rich man had, had exceeding many flocks and herds but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. He did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and is spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. Just the story is very simple. There were two men, A and B. A very rich, B, very poor. And this B has just one little lamb. And he took care of that lamb. It was just like a daughter. And this A has a lot in his herd. And then he traveling came to A. And instead of taking one of the many sheep that he had to prepare meal for the visitor, he took the only little lamb that the poor man had. And then Nathan, of course, you know the story. Nathan had not told David the meaning of the parable. Let's see the reaction now. Judge not that he be not judged. Severely judging other people. 
unmercifully judging other people in a very terrible way with heavy weight judging other people look at the reaction of Bibi and David Sanga was greatly kindled against the man and he said to Nathan as the Lord leaves the man that has done this thing tell me the rest just surely die Wait a minute, David, can you give me a verse where it says if somebody stole somebody else's lamb and killed that lamb, not a human being, that that fellow, the punishment is death. No, there's no verse like that. All you can find is that if you steal an oxen, an ox, you'll pay with five oxen. And if you steal a sheep, a lamb, you'll pay with four lambs. That's all you can find. You don't kill a man because he, you know, took another person's lamb and then killed that lamb and made a meal for a visitor. You see that kind of judgment. The poor man now is, you know, because they stole this thing, that means the rich man will die. As the Lord leaves. The man that has done this sin shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this sin and because he had no pity. Now what he said on the other part now to restore for, that's all the Bible says. But you know, uh, this David now went beyond the Bible. Are there people that do that in their criticism? Somebody has done something wrong. Granted, this is wrong. Granted, this is not right. Well, if you are going to correct at all, why don't you go back to the Bible? What penalty, what punishment does the Bible recommend for an offense like this? But now David went beyond. He'll do what the Bible says before we kill him. He's going to pay what for, for an effort sheep. And then after that, he's going to lose his life. And then eventually now, Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. What are we going to do now? Thou art the man. Now the man was asking for mercy. The mercy we are not willing to show to other people. We need mercy ourselves. So the Lord shall mark iniquity who can stand. Calvary has given you forgiveness. The grace of God has brought you to salvation. Overlook everything you have done. A day, a day comes in your life. You yourself, you are looking for mercy. Why don't you show that mercy to other people? Why do you jump on other people? Oppress other people? Destroy other people? For a sin of naught, for a little lamb. The Lord is telling us, judge not, that she be not judged. Number seven, he reproves us for officially, officiously judging others when no one has made us a ruler, a judge, a magistrate over them. You know, there are people that appoint themselves as, uh, you know, the judge and the magistrate over everybody. And they intimidate everyone. They carry themselves in such a way as if, you know, they're really the judge in the community. Or in the, maybe in a family. Or maybe in the church. And then we become afraid of them more than we fear God. And the way they go around, you know, they make themselves, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? And find out the man is not even a worker in the church. The man is not even a leader in the church. Nobody has appointed them, and yet they carry this office all about, and everybody is afraid of them. And the Lord is saying, Judge not, that she be not judged. Don't carry an office that nobody has given you. Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, we're reading there about, uh, you know, such a man. And the Lord is telling us that is what not to do. In Romans chapter 14 verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servants? Wait a minute. We're children of God. We're responsible to God. Wait a minute. Jesus is our Lord and Master. Is a savior. Who are you? you? Even you want to have more control over us than Jesus is even having over us. Jesus gives us some liberty, some freedom. He wants us to be happy, not to commit sin, but to live a righteous life. 
And then you officiously, officially, you're going about as if, you know, if we're happy, that brings a problem to you. You don't want to see us smile or laugh or be happy or enjoy a Christian life. Who are you, by the way? That judges another man, servant, to his own master, his standards or fallings. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. And then we're told in verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? And why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all appear, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. I pray God will give us love gentleness and mercy towards one another so all this judging judging criticizing condemning everything will go away from our fellowship in jesus name i'm coming to point number three now exhortation exhortation on unbiased judgment exhortation on unbiased judgment we're looking at matthew chapter 7 matthew chapter 7 we're looking at verses 1 and 2 Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. Judge not, that ye be not judged. You know, brothers and sisters, if you've been doing something all through your life, and that has become a habit, after a Bible study like this, you sit down, and then you, you watch your life. What have I been doing? Do I pass comments hastily over people's lives? Do I just do something because it has become a habit? You know, if a vehicle is going down the slope, it will keep on going down the slope. If you don't do something about it, apply the brake on that vehicle. And then when you apply the brake, let the vehicle stop. And then you think, do I still want to go down to that valley? Or do I want to turn around and go to a better place, a useful place? Look at the vehicle of your life and look at the way you're moving down the slope. And everybody is running away from you, judging this, condemning this, criticizing this, and slashing this, and cutting down that one. Although you have knowledge, but your knowledge is making you an enemy of everybody. Why don't you stop the vehicle, apply the brake, and stop, and then think, so and so was my friend. It's no more my friend. What happened? So and so used to come to visit me. It's no more coming to visit me. What happened? So and so was in my house fellowship. He's gone to another person. What happened? And then you're going to find out just one thing. The critical tongue. Then apply the brake and stop. And say, that means I'm going to do this no more. I'm not going to be a judge anymore. I'm going to be a brother. I'm going to be a sister. I'm just going to be a blessing in the lives of other people. No more judging. Even when somebody does something that yesterday you would have commented and said, No, this is a new day. I've applied the break. I'm not going to do that anymore. And somebody told you something, is telling you something now in the past. This is what you'll comment. You'll say, Ah, anybody that did that, then you check yourself. Say, Hmm. Put on the brake. I'm stopping. I'm not going to do that anymore. And it, it may take you a week, it may take you a month that you're applying the brake, applying the brake. So an urge will come out from within you that this is the coming to pass. This is what to do. And this is what to do. Then you apply the brake inside. Say, no, I'm not going to do that. And then you're going to look for something better to say. If they tell you something negative about so-and-so, something that, you know, you have passed negative comment about so-and-so, you try and find out the good things in that person's life. And then you say, but, you know, that brother, although you are talking like this, but look at this and look at this and look at this. And when you become positive like that, people begin to notice that so and so is no more as critical condemning other people like he used to do and then the friends you have lost by the grace of God it will come back and the job you have lost by the grace of God it will come back and the people that are running away from you they will run towards you now apply the break apply the break in Luke I'm reading from chapter 6 Luke chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 37. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. 
Uh, have you noticed that when you criticize, you attract criticism to yourself too? If you're very critical, if you're very negative, now it's going to be like a point. What you sow is what you reap. As you throw stones at other people, you throw it with one hand. Ten hands are throwing stones at you. That's the reason why judge not, that she be not judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. The Lord will help us. You know, if you do this, it's going to be a wonderful life from now on. In John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge. As I hear, I judge. I can of my own self do nothing. It's only when I hear from God, I hear from heaven. As I hear, I judge. Somebody comes to tell you something you've heard from him. But wait until you hear from heaven. You hear from God. God, are you saying anything to this? God says, no, I'm not saying anything. This is not important. This is insignificant. This is non-essential. I've not heard anything from heaven. I'm not going to say anything. And practice that. Practice that. Let the Spirit of God speak to you before you speak to other people. Rather than, you know, you observe this and you notice this and you notice then you jump up. Have you heard anything from God? Have you had any sin from Christ who sits on the throne? As I hear, I judge. Until you hear what he's saying. Then not pass any comment. And he says, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will. Don't seek your own will. I want this done. I want this. I want nothing. Don't you want anything? Don't want anything. This must be done my way. Why? Why must it be done that way? Just say, the will of God be done. And if it's the will of God that's to be done, you'll not be judging this and judging that. And then it says, but the will of the Father which has sent me. And then in chapter 7 of John, chapter 7, verse 24. John 7, verse 24. It says, when the, uh, John 7, 24. In John 7, verse 24, here is what it says. Judge not according to appearance. Judge not according to appearance. And you see sometimes, something appears this way. As you wait, and you are patient, and you look at that thing properly, then you see that what it first appeared to be, is not what it's, it is really. Therefore, you are not in a hurry. You see, if I'm going to pass any comment, I want to be a wise man, a wise woman. I'm not going to just say, the way it appears to me at the first time, that's how to judge properly. It says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You know, sometimes it takes a day or two, or even more, while you are thinking of that thing. Should it be like that? Is it actually like that? What did that person mean by what he said? And what was his intention and motive by what he did? And it's when you think through like that, you're not just this what it appears to be. You don't want to judge on that. Judge not according to appearance. It appears like this for the moment. It appears like this for the moment. Don't, don't judge then, but then judge righteous judgment. After thinking through, after seeing all the details, and after you've now, you now know a day or two after that, okay, this is how it is. Then you can now put on the right correction. The Lord will help us. And it's when we do it like this, we'll be able to have mercy and gentleness and compassion on other people. Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, brethren, if any man, if a man be overtaken in a fault, let's even say now, after we have thought through, this is not just the first appearance, we have thought through, we've seen the details, and now we know that the man is at fault, and we want to correct him. What are we going to do? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, I'm sure we're spiritual. I said we're spiritual. Restore such and one in a spirit of meekness. Don't bully on people. Don't shout on people. Don't be too aggressive. And slow down your movement. 
And if people see you as an aggressive man, aggressive woman, because of the way you carry yourself, and when you hear something, the first time you hear it, the way it pumps up in your heart, your steps, your movement, your language, everything, and they don't see the meekness. Why don't you slow down and then get some meekness, some gentleness and love. Restore such and one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself. Considering thyself, what does that mean? Considering thyself, if I were in this situation, could I have done better? If I didn't have the knowledge I have now, and I have just the limit of the knowledge he has, would I have done better? If I'm going through family problem, family pressure, like he is going through, and then he's acting because of you know, the family pressure on him, if I were in the same situation, wouldn't I have done the same thing if I lost my job, and then it appears only my wife is working, and then I'm feeling ashamed that my wife is not working and feeding me, and then would I not be as irritated as that man is considering thyself that is put yourself in the shoes of the other person and what yes what they did might even be wrong but ask yourself why did they do what they did is it the way they felt is it their ignorance is it their lack of understanding is it their immaturity put yourself in their shoes considering thyself lest thou also be tempted bear ye one another's burden don't add to the burdens of my brother of my sister there bear the bodies of them and so fulfill the law of christ we will do it i said we will do it matthew chapter 7 verse 1 verse 2 the lord is teaching us and is saying our life should be different from now we've learned so much we know so much judge not that she be not judged. For with what measure ye do, what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Let's rise up and tell the Lord to give us grace to be more gentle, to be more loving, to be more compassionate, to be more considerate, to be more thoughtful, and to be slower in passing comment. To be slower in jumping on people. You know, people have feelings. And people can, you know, uh, feel the pressure. Let's lift the body from them. And be gentle towards people. Be nice towards people. Help them to feel that life is worth living. Don't increase the pressure. Don't increase the problem. Say, Lord, I'm going to apply the break. I'm going to be very slow in passing comments on people. I'm going to be very slow criticizing other people. In fact, there will be no criticism anymore. I'm going to be very constructive in my life. I want to help people. I want to help people. I don't want people running away from me. I don't want people, you know, saying that man is hard, that woman is tall. I want to have some honey and attract people to the sweetness in my life. I want to be bitter, be like gall, be like pepper, be like onion, irritating people, driving people away from me. You need friends. You need people to cooperate with you. Be nice to people. Yes, I know. People make their mistakes. You make your mistakes too. Sometimes people are going to do wrong things. You've done some wrong things too in the past. If they do wrong, it's not by jumping on them, criticizing them, condemning them. And that's not how to correct them. That will not improve anybody. It's by trying to understand them. What are they going through? I don't understand. What are they passing through? I've not thought about. What are they missing in life that is making them to be like they are that I've not considered? 
What wrong information do they have that makes them to be who they are? And I'm not conscious of that. What's their upbringing? What did they see with daddy and mommy when they were younger that is now influencing them to be like this? You know, if you try to understand people, you'll be more gentle with them. They need somebody like you to pick them up, to draw them near. They need friends too. When they are negative, try to understand why they are negative. And then you be the positive element in their lives. How can you help somebody you are judging? Have you ever seen any of those judges and magistrates being of great help to those criminals? No. Those criminals don't even want to hear any other word from the judge or the magistrate. And if we make ourselves judges and magistrates, the people don't want to hear any other word from us. You have condemned me. Go your way. You've cut me down. What else are you going to tell me? I don't want to hear anything from you again. That's what they will say. But if we can just apply the break in our lives and turn around love people no matter what they do even the prodigal son can come back home whatever they do show that the knowledge of the scripture is doing good in you love them Your tone of voice, your appearance, your courage, your comportment. Let it convey, transmit love, compassion, mercy to them. Don't judge them in your heart. You know, if you just say, I'm not going to judge them with my words. If you judge them in your heart, they will know. Because, you know, the thought of your heart will affect the appearance on your face. They will know you don't love them 100%. Don't judge your heart. Don't judge your attitude. Just love from the depth of your heart. Maybe that action of theirs is wrong. That's just one action. Look at other areas of their lives that are commendable, that you appreciate, that you can praise. Areas of their lives that are praiseworthy. Then there will be sincere love, mercy, and compassion in your heart towards them. Judge not that ye be not judged. Don't be that severe. It applies to everybody, fathers in the home, husbands in the family, wives in the family, mothers to the children. Radiate love. children to the parents you know children parents need love too they need appreciation too don't judge those parents you don't know the pressures they are going through why they do what they do why they say what they say in spite of it all love your parents Leaders in the church, love the members, love the workers, 
I see this, I see that. Yes, they are growing. Sometimes you see actions of immaturity. But love us all the same. Judge not. Privately or publicly. Your heart or your tongue. Judge not. Let's follow Christ. Yes, there are times to correct people. Correct with the heart of love. Let your knowledge be put to positive, advantageous use. Be merciful, be loving, be compassionate. Attract people. Don't repel them. Do the best you can do through love, through grace, through kindness to make the lives of other people happier. Judge not.